Ine alhamdulillah, wa salat, wa salam Allah, wa rasul Allah. I hope you guys enjoy watching our uh, commercials. And uh, before I begin the class, I just want to make a note, guys. Uh, we are desperately, desperately in need of uh, donations to help pay our website expenses. You know, uh, we are not affiliated with a masjid. We're not affiliated uh, with any other organization. We are a nonprofit organization in and of ourselves. Okay. And uh, it takes money to pay for these um, uh, uh, classes and the programs that I'm running. Uh, this is the first of the month coming up in two days. I don't need to interrupt, but I can't hear you. Okay. Thank you. Wait a minute. Yeah, we have the. Um, the first of the month is coming up and uh, we are desperately in need of donations because this program that we're using here uh, itself is $300 per month. Okay. And uh, then we have all other, you know, we pay for everything monthly. Uh, unfortunately, by us not being a commodity or anything, we can't get millions of dollars donated for the whole year. We just need 2000 Well, we need over, we need over $2,000 a month. Uh, to cover our website expenses, please. So please guys support us. Um, we don't have anything in our account right now because mashallah, the donations that were made yesterday covered what came out today at the end of the month. So please uh, click on that, uh, scan that QR code if you enjoy learning Islam and its truthfulness with the understanding of the companions. And that's what's important. There's a lot of Muslims out there teaching Islam. There's a lot of Muslims out there speaking about Islam, but are they giving you the information based on how the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam understood it? For example, when you come to these people and they're teaching or talking about polygamy, are they speaking about polygamy with the understanding that the companions had about it? And by the way, that's going to be our new topic for the Call in and Ask Sister Layla show. The Calling and Sister and Layla show is, is uh, held every Friday at 9 p.m. And you can call in and, or come here and ask your questions live to me. And inshallah, I'll answer them. And if I can't answer, Sheikh Morsi is on standby to answer for you. And we'll also, in between the answering of questions, we'll begin to, we'll be discuss, discussing polygamy in Islam. That's the problem. So many people can talk about it. So many people practice it. How many of them are practicing it the way the companions understood it to be practiced? We have a lot of Muslims teaching what I'm teaching, aqidah, belief. But are they teaching you what the belief system of the Muslim is that with the understanding that the companions had about it? Or are they teaching you from a method? Are they teaching you from some set, some group? OK, so we have to be careful of how and who we take our knowledge from. You cannot teach yourself this, the religion. You have to have a teacher. So if you enjoy learning things here from me here at Sunnah Followers and my cousin Mukhtar and the other people that we have here, please support us. Please support us, guys, by donating so we can stay on the internet and we can continue to be professional in our appearance, professional in our delivery, you know, and accurate, you know, in the information, you know, that we present to you. And with that said, let's get started on uh, uh, the class for today, this class, which is our Aqidah class. And Aqidah refers to the belief system of the Muslim. And we are using the book uh, written by Sheikh Kareem Abu Zaid. And I'm sure most of you have heard of uh, uh, Kareem Abu Zaid. He travels all over the world uh, doing uh, lectures, uh, holding conferences. In fact, he'll be having, he'll be hosting, uh, they'll be hosting a conference for him and Sheikh Muhammad Saeed Atli's uh, community uh, this weekend. Uh, uh, this is Sheikh Kareem Abu Zaid. And this is the book that I'm teaching from, Diluting. It's entitled Diluting, Diluting Walla Walbera. 
And what is Walla Wabara? It refers to the second part of that Shahada when we declare La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah. We are also declaring that our allegiance, our allegiance, our allegiance is only, I repeat, only, I repeat again, only to Allah to the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the believers no matter who they are and where they are on this earth okay we violate that last part all the time and i've given you the examples how when you're celebrating birthdays and celebrating non muslim holidays you're it's not an issue of haram it's an issue of allegiance where's your allegiance are you living up to that statement, that testimony of faith or not? If you're uh, uh, participating in holidays and events that have nothing to do with Islam, where's your allegiance? Allah commands us to distance ourselves from the unbelievers, to distance ourselves from those and that which opposes Allah, his laws, his rules his commands okay islam is we don't have allegiance to a people because of their race because of the color of their skin we don't have allegiance to people because they came from a certain part of the world our what brings us together as muslims is our belief in allah and our practice of this deen that's it and that's what this book is all about and uh, I ask you guys to read chapter two. We had a quiz yesterday, which covered chapter one. So now we're going to be moving on today to chapter two of this masterpiece. Okay. And let me put the PowerPoint up on the screen for tonight's discussion. Okay. Inshallah, you'll be able to see it. Uh, let's see if I can wait a minute. This Zoom is in my way. It's always the Zoom. Okay, so here we go. This is session four of this series. And this, the second chapter of this wonderful book speaks about how as Muslims, when we declare allegiance to Allah and to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the believers, it enables us to become distinct. What does that mean? That means we're different. And I know this is hard to understand because we're living in the days of fitting, the days of fitting that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam warned us of, the days in which Islam will become strange the days in which it will go back to how it used to be in the dark ages before Islam, the days in which the Sunnah will become abandoned and the Sunnah will become replaced with fatwa from others than Allah and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. When people will adopt understandings mm -hmm. and ideologies that oppose Islam. Well, in this day and era, it, we, Muslims today, so many of them are apologetic. They are, are apologetic about being Muslims and they seem to believe ever since 9-11 that they have, that they owe an explanation. You have to apologize and explain why this is your way of life. That is not the way it's supposed to be. We're not like them. We're not supposed to conform and become like them. We're not supposed to adopt their ways, adopt their mannerisms, or even adopt their thinking. We're supposed to embrace being distinct, which means different, strong, resilient, resolute, and different. And that's what this chapter uh, focuses on. And let's look at the, uh, how Sheikh Kareem Abu Zaid begins this. He tells us that the Muslim community distinguishes itself from other communities by its unique beliefs, its rituals, its ethical standards, and actions of charity. 
and it does not mindlessly mimic or imitate the practices of other societies. I have a lot of young Muslim girls that come to the website and I'm encouraging them since they are over the age of seven, they should be wearing hijab. They should be wearing hijab every time they leave the house. This is another misconception that some uneducated Muslims have. They will tell their daughters that they don't have to cover up until puberty. Every woman knows it's too late then. The prophet Muhammad said, teach your children, teach your children, teach your children the religion when they are seven years old, make them practice it when they are 10. If you wait until a girl has, has her menses, I'm sorry, the hormones are there. The gene has attached to her. She's looking for sex, baby. There's no way you're going to get her to cover up now. It's too late. So these girls grow up with self-esteem issues. You know, they think that because they wear the hijab, it makes them strange. It makes them different and it makes them bad. That in order to be accepted, they have to be naked like the other women around them. No, no, no. You parents failed your children at that point. If you had your daughters covering up at the age of seven, it would become habit for them. And they would feel uncomfortable not being covered by the time menses hits them. So we have to teach our children that our differences the differences that we have from the non-believers is what, what distinguishes us and what sets us apart and makes us better than them because we don't care about looks. We're not living our lives to please man. We understand what our purpose is. We understand that we were created to worship Allah. And this, we were put here on this earth to be tested in our belief. So you explain that to your children when they're seven and then when they're puberty, they'll practice naturally. So the unique feature, this unique feature of being distinguished from others because of our moral ethics, our unique belief system, you know, this results in our faith being complete and unwavering. It results in your children growing up being devoted to Allah and the teachings of his prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and not caring about what other people have to say or impressing others. As Muslims, we place a high value on adhering to our Islamic teachings. We place a high value on our Islamic values. And this is something that has to be reiterated with ourselves and our children on a regular basis. I hope this stuff is clear to you guys. My Sunnah follower kids, they should be covering up. I, was, I started wearing hijab 24 hours on a regular basis at the age of seven. I don't even know what the sun feels like on my hair, okay? And don't care to feel it, okay? I was covering my body wearing baggy clothes at the age of seven so that when I did reach puberty, I pubered at the age of nine. My mother was smart to follow that hadith because my period didn't come at 10. My period came at nine. That's the Arabic blood in me. OK, by the time I was nine, it was no mystery. I didn't have a problem. Yeah, well, you know, you now, you know, I'm wearing baggy clothes. I'm covering up and I know I'm that in a bag of chips. You don't like it tough. That was my attitude with the Kaffir kids. I said, yeah, I'm different. I'm better than you and I'm beautiful. I look better than all y'all. You don't like it tough. Put your hands on me. I'm taking you out. That was my attitude growing up. I never was intimidated, never was ashamed of who I was. I like to be the different one, different but distinct, okay? That's good. To be different and distinct is a good thing, okay? 
We have to educate our children and ourselves to understand that the Muslim community is distinguished by the people that make it up. And the best of us are those who are righteous. And who are the righteous? We're the ones that stick to the commands of Allah. You know, again, our allegiance is to anyone who declares la ilaha illallah Muhammad Dora Rasulullah. Anyone that declares that their blood, their property, their honor is sacred. So if there's a woman that doesn't wear hijab, that doesn't c cover up, she still, her blood, her honor, and her uh, property is still sacred. But what makes this community strong and distinct are those who are covering, those who are practicing the religion as they're supposed to be. And that's why as Muslims, we have to work hard to try to help each other, help one another to adhere to the commands of Allah, to not be like the Kafir and blend in, to be distinct like Allah commands us to do. That's the strength. Our strength is in practicing the religion, not just declaring it, okay? And you have to emphasize that with your children and let the people know that the prophet Muhammad Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam set the example for us, him and his companions. Remember, they were during this was Islam, a law decreed for Islam to come about during the worst time in humanity's existence, the dark ages, the medieval period. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his companions were looked at as being strange because they were different. But then when the people studied them, when the Quraysh studied them and watched them, they said, wait a minute, they're not really strange. They have something that we don't have. They have unity, togetherness. They care about each other. They share. They look out for each other. That's what made Khalid bin Walid, radiallahu anhu. That's what made him convert to Islam. He watched the, how they, you know, how they treated each other with such dignity and respect. So he said, they're not strange. They're distinct. They're better than everybody else. And that's what made him convert. So again, guys, the Muslim community distinguishes itself because of our beliefs, our rituals, and our ethics. And we have to work together to try to instill that belief, those ethics and, and, and all into the people that make up the community. Again, we become righteous, not by the way we dress. Just because a woman wears a, a, a burqa doesn't make her righteous. Just because a man has a beard doesn't make him righteous. Just because a woman has a hijab and an abaya on doesn't make her righteous. What makes her righteous is how he or she upholds the teachings of our religion and how we take those teachings and put them into action. How we take the teachings of our religion and change the condition of ourselves from that which is bad to something better. And also how we become righteous is based on how we stand up for justice, the compassion that we show to others who are weaker than us and the humility that we have. We don't allow our distinctiveness to cause us to become cocky. We don't allow our distinctiveness to cause us to become conceited and vain. So we have to have humility. This is what leads to the beauty and the wisdom of Islam. This is what attracts others to our way of life, to our way of thinking. Like I was saying yesterday, so many young Muslim men and women waste their time on social media debating and arguing the religion. You're not making us look good. You're not giving dawah. You're showing how, how oppressive we can be, how angry we can get, how ignorant we can get, you know? Mm -hmm.
You want to impress the people, you impress them through your behavior, through your humility, through your dignity. Subhana Allah. That's why I'm always emphasizing dignity, humility, and balance. Dignity, humility, and balance. That's how we give dawah. That's how people, what will cause people to look at us in a good way. It makes us unique. And we have to understand that being unique does not just uh, entail isolating yourself. This is another misconception that some Muslims have. They say, well, since I don't want myself or my children, my wives or my children to be like the calf, I'm just gonna lock them up, keep them in the house. They can't go out for nothing. They can't interact with anyone. You know, no, we don't do that. We don't isolate ourselves because remember the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught us, he said the strong believer is more loved by Allah than the weak one. There's always going to be fitna. We're, there's, there's no Islamic utopia anywhere. We're going to always be surrounded by something that contradicts our morality, that contradicts our faith. You have to be able to handle that. So isolating ourselves is not the way either. On the contrary, Islam teaches us to interact with others. And through that interaction, in turn, we promote understanding. In turn, we promote tolerance. In turn, we promote our good values. So we are encouraged as Muslims to associate with other people, especially from different cultures, and try to seek common ground while maintaining our identity. Is this clear? I love the way Sheikh Kareem Abu Zaid put this in words because there's too many Muslims out there that think that the way to be distinct is through isolation. You want to lock your wives and children in a house. Oh, are you crazy? When your children do grow up and get out in the world, they're going to, how are they going to adapt? You guys see those shows about the Amish people. When those Amish children leave their homes and go out to the world, look how they become. They suck up everything and look where they are, drug addicts, prostitutes now, destroyed. They can't handle it. You know, Islam doesn't encourage isolation. It wants us to interact with others. And through our manners, our behavior, our dignity, our humility and balance, others learn from us. That's true dawah, okay? Okay. And again, you know, what is it that distinguishes us Muslims? Is Tawheed. And what does Tawheed mean? Tawheed means to worship Allah alone. That is what separates us. It separates us from the Christians. They claim to believe in Allah, but they don't worship him alone. It separates us from the Jews. They too claim to believe in Allah but they don't worship him alone. And it separates us from any other people that claim to believe in an entity, but they worship something else other than, than Allah. So Tawheed is critical for us because it distinguishes us from the non-Muslims. You know, to truly say that I worship Allah alone, what does that mean? That means I'm balanced, I'm balanced. I'm not going to love anyone more than I love Allah. I'm not going to obey anyone over Allah. And it's something that you sisters need to understand. A lot of you sisters don't fast. You haven't made up your Ramadan fast. Let me share an email I got this morning. A sister sent me an email saying that she did not make up any Ramadan fast because her husband told her that she cannot fast unless he gives her permission. This is ignorance. That hadith is not talking about Ramadan. The prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said when it comes to a voluntary fast, a voluntary fast, a voluntary fast, voluntary means you ain't got to do it. 
He said, no woman can do a voluntary fast unless she seeks, you know, approval from her husband. Ramadan is an obligatory fast. If your husband tells you to break your Ramadan fast, you tell him, sorry, no, this isn't a command from my Lord. If you are making up your days from Ramadan, the same rules apply. A woman cannot break her fast because you're, this is the Ramadan, all the rules apply. So for you sisters who have not made up your Ramadan, that means you didn't fast Ramadan and the sin is going to be on you because learning the religion is an obligation upon all of us. You can't blame your husband for that. Allah is not going to say it's your husband's fault. When the angel of death pulls your soul, they're going to ask you, why didn't you know the rules? a fasting and a woman. Didn't Allah say in the Quran that seeking knowledge is an obligation upon all Muslims, male and female? You're held accountable for that, women. Don't put that on your husband. You should have learned, you should learn your religion. It's important that we all understand that it's an obligation on us individually to learn this deen. How can you be Muslim all your life and not know that can't nobody make you or tell you not to do Ramadan? Are you crazy? You don't know the difference between a voluntary fast and an obligatory one. So again, having tall heat, worshiping Allah alone means I don't obey no one over him. I don't love anyone more than him. I put nothing before him. That's what makes us distinct. That's what made Aisha, radiallahu anha, distinct. When her parents told her to thank the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, for vindicating her, she said, no, I'm thanking Allah. Allah vindicated me. And that's why the prophet said, oh, Aisha, you are a siddiqa. You are guided to the truth, okay? She loved the prophet Muhammad as a husband and she loved him as a messenger too, but she didn't love him more than Allah. She knew who the thanks was, was due to. So that distinction, our tawheed, our uh, worship of Allah alone is what defines our character. It's what defines and governs our actions. It's what makes us distinct. And it's the foundation of our faith. And y'all need to understand that. That's the foundation of our faith. Also, as Muslims, we shape our beliefs. We shape our behaviors. We shape our actions by adhering to Allah's laws, by putting him first, by doing what he says and not questioning why. Allah commands all believing women to cover their bodies except for their face and hands when they leave the house. I don't care about what your husband say. Your husband doesn't want you to dress that way because he thinks it makes you a target. He's insecure. That's his problem. Allah says you have to dress this way so you obey him. And tell your husband to either get some, get a man, become a man, or get a divorce. Allah says that rectos relation intimacy and intimacy on your menses are haram. You don't sit there and let your husband do that. You tell him, no, this is a sacrilege against what my Lord said. So you got to go. See, that's what distinguishes us. A woman that can stand up and do that, that's a distinguished woman. She's not like the typical woman that say, okay, baby, do whatever you want. The sin is on you. No, the sin is on both of you. It's on him because he wanted to do it and it's on you because you allowed him. That's the reality, 
okay? And distinctiveness is what leads to righteousness. A Muslim woman or a Muslim man that is distinct is righteous because they're not gonna allow anything to compromise you know, the laws of Allah. So to understand the gap between Muslims and non-Muslims, as Muslims, we're supposed to do that. Understand that, you know, we're, we're, we live together in the same society, the same country. We get along, but we're different. This does not mean that we're intolerant. This does not mean that we're hostile. Let me give an example. I was watching a video on YouTube, some crazy Muslim kid, kid, man, some crazy Muslim man had a booth on a street corner. That seems to be the thing nowadays. Muslims are setting up book tables on street corners, talking about Islam to people, screaming and hollering. This dude called himself a Muslim given dawah. It was on TV, it's on YouTube, because he looks stupid. The women are walking past in their hot pants. You know, this is the summer. Kaffirs don't cover up. They looking like Nicki Minaj and Cardi B. That's part of the norm. He's standing there holding the Quran in his hand, screaming and hollering at the women, calling them prostitutes, telling them that they're going to burn in hell and all this unless they come to a law. And, and everybody laughing. The people were videoing him and laughing and said, these people are crazy. And I heard somebody in the audience say, y'all better check and make sure he ain't got a bomb in one of those bags. Look how he made us look. Because he doesn't understand the concept of wala wala better, allegiance and disassociation. Okay, we disassociate from the non-Muslims. We let it be known that we're different and distinct but that doesn't mean that we become hostile towards them, that we're going to yell and scream and call them prostitutes and, 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 and treat them badly because their lifestyle is not like ours. Islam teaches compassion, generosity, and respect for all people, regardless of their beliefs or their backgrounds. The prophet Muhammad respected the Jews. He respected the Christians. He even respected the pagans to a certain extent, you know? That's the thing, we are people of balance, balance, balance. We're not too far to the right, nor are we too far to the left. We're balanced, balanced. Take your little booth down. Why do you have a booth on a street corner anyway? You know, go home and learn the religion. If seeing women walk around naked bothers you, then your home is better for you. It shows you're not qualified to stand out in the middle of the street giving dawah. If you can't handle looking at naked women, you ain't qualified to talk to them to give them dawah. Okay? Also, again, uh, Islam encourages us to promote understanding when we uh, facilitate interaction with others. You have to be understanding when you interact with others, understand that this is their lifestyle. They don't, they don't dress the way we dress. We don't dress the way they dress, okay? But we get along. I'm not gonna force my way on them, nor am I gonna allow them to force their way on me. You know, this is what Islam encourages. Also guys, on the day of judgment, the Prophet وسلم, told us that he will be able to identify uh, who his followers, who the people of his ummah, his nation are. And the way he'll be able to identify who we are is because of the good characteristics that we implemented here. Okay. He said, you know, the same way if you put one black bull with a white, with a, a, a herd of white bulls, that black bull will stand out. That's how he'll be able to recognize us, the we believers, for those of us who were distinguished in this world, we will be distinguished in the hereafter and the prophet will know who we are. 
Listen to what he said. He said, your likeness among the people is the likeness of a white hair on the skin of a black bull or a strip on the foreleg of a donkey. This insignificant, I mean, this, this insightful remark that the prophet gave us shows that because of our distinctiveness in this world, because of how we carried ourselves and, and upheld the laws of Allah, we'll be distinct on that day too. And he'll know us. He'll recognize us. He'll know who the believers are of his nation. And he will know who the weak ones were too. Okay? Also, The gap between those of us who submit to Allah and follow the teachings of Islam and those who reject Allah and who only pick and choose what to follow, you know, we're different. Just like we're different from the non-believers, we're different from uh, the hypocrites too. The prophet will be able to distinguish who are the strong from who are the weak on that day. And one of the ways is because we'll have a light about us too. We talked about that when I did the whole series on uh, the hereafter, we talked about how uh, on the day of judgment, some of us will have a, a, a glow about us. That glow about us will just separate us from the sinful Muslims. That glow that we have will also separate us from the unbelievers. And we talked about how when the Muslims go forward across the bridge, those of us with the glow will go first. The sinful Muslims won't have that glow and they'll try to go forward, but they'll be held back. They won't be able to move. So this is one of the ways in which the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will be able to distinguish us. So it has to be made clear that by us Muslims having the characteristics that Allah commands us to develop, such as compassion towards others, to be generous with others, and to be just with others, even if it's against ourselves, you know, it has to be made clear that by us preserving these values, in turn, we are preserving Islam, guys. Remember, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was sent during the worst era of mankind. And what did he tell the people? He said, I am sent to teach you good manners. I am sent to teach you good character. I am sent to teach you good morality. And by teaching you these three things, in turn, I am teaching you Islam. Okay? So to be a Muslim, you have to check your character, guys. Look at yourself. Are you a person of humility? Are you kind in your dealings with others? Are you generous? Or are you abusive? You claim that you a good Muslim because you got a beard, because you wearing hijab. No, check your attitude, check your behavior too. The clothes don't make us. The clothes are the laws. The clothes show that you fear a law. Yeah, I fear a law, but it's your attitude, your behavior, your actions that make you either a hypocrite or a true believer. Y'all understand that? A lot of people dressed apart, but don't really believe. That's the hypocrite. Okay. Listen to what, um, 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 listen to what uh, 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 Ibn Masood said. He said, uh, we were 40 companions with the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam one day and we were in a tent and he said would you be happy to know that one fourth of the people of paradise would be muslim would be you muslims they said yes he said would it make you happy to know that one third of the people of paradise would be you they said yes 
He said, then I hope you will be happy to know that half the people of paradise will come from my nation. And this is because no one will enter paradise unless they believe in Allah. There are no Kafirs in paradise and you will be distinguished. I will be able to distinguish you from the people of shirt. Like a white hair on the skin of a black bull can be distinguished. So the people of paradise, there will be no Christians, no Jews in paradise. Every prophet was Muslim. They all came with the same message. The inhabitants of paradise will be nothing in religion but Muslim. And our nation, the followers of the prophet Muhammad وسلم, will make up half of that. The other prophets, their followers that were with them will make up the other half, okay? So this distinction emphasizes the stark difference between believers and unbelievers. It underlines that on that momentous day, the objective measure of distinction will be based on your faith. Y'all see that? and your commitment to the Islamic teachings, not your race, not your ethnicity, not the fact that you speak Arabic. I want my Arabic people to understand that. Boy, y'all doing some crazy stuff. We got some Arabs here who believe that just because they are Arabic and speak Arabic slang, by the way, you only speak slang, but they think because they're Arabic and speak Arabic slang, that they don't have to practice the religion. They're going to be in paradise. I don't know where y'all get that nonsensical belief from because the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam spoke against that garbage. And if you really speak Arabic and can read Arabic, you should know that. You know, it's not your race. It's not your language. It's not your color that's going to put you in paradise. It's how strong you believe in Allah whether you fear this punishment to the point where you put to practice what he commands us to practice. That's what put, gets you in paradise. Does everybody understand that? Okay. And one of the things that the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam emphasized to us Muslims guys, which I have to emphasize over and over again to you too, is the importance of being clean. This is one of the things that distinguishes us from the non-Muslims. The non-Muslims don't care about how they look. The men walk around with their pants underneath their behind showing their underwear. The women walk around in a pair of a drawers and a bra showing all their body. That's not beauty. And they think that's beauty. That's not beauty. That's called nakedness. That's called slovenliness. Allah loves beauty. And Allah loves cleanliness. And you have to teach that to your children, especially your daughters. Being naked is not how we define beauty. If you got to take off your clothes to be attractive, then something's wrong with you. Okay? In Islam, cleanliness and that beauty is what differentiates us from the non-Muslims. Being clean incorporates spiritual and physical uh, beauty. Okay? How can you? I look at you? You're walking around in a pair of underwear and a bra because it's summertime. And I would look at you as being a nasty woman. That's the kind of woman that I wouldn't want my son to hook up with. If she's got to take off her clothes and be naked, she's probably got that nasty woman's disease. Y'all know what that nasty woman's disease is? Chlamydia. You know how many of these women have chlamydia? That's the biggest uh, STD. That's the number one STD in the world is chlamydia. Chlamydia comes from having sex with multiple partners. Chlamydia also comes from having sex with a woman on her period. Chlamydia also comes from having anal sex too. So you got to be careful, brothers, 
You weak brothers out there, you look at these naked women, you know, with those hair weaves and those big behinds, they probably are filled with nothing but chlamydia. Chlamydia. And that's a nasty woman's disease that men get and you pass it on to whoever you have relations with. And it's on the rise. They had a special on the news today about it. They said one out of, listen at this guys, they did statistics. One out of every five Americans has chlamydia. Ooh, it makes the, of the youth. One out of every five of the youth that's having relations has chlamydia. That's disgusting. So y'all better be careful where y'all where y'all playing at. Okay. Purity, cleanliness leads to uh, a spiritual uh, beauty and physical beauty. And you have to put that type of belief in your children's mind. Okay. So as Muslims, we work on worshiping Allah alone. We also work on adapting the behavior, the characteristics that he emphasizes. We work on keeping ourselves clean and also performing those daily prayers because those daily prayers are what also distinguishes us from the non-believers. The non-believers, they may go to church once a week if they do that to remember Allah. We remember Allah every day, over five times a day by making our prayers. That also radiates purity and beauty. Does everybody understand that? Okay. Also, beyond the confines of belief, spiritual purity is the pursuit of inner serenity and virtual, virtuous living through the acts of worship, doing them the way the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught us, that'll make, that'll bring about an inner peace within yourself because it's going to strengthen your connection to Allah. It's going to make you think before you do something that you know you shouldn't do. It's going to make you question yourself and ask yourself, is this an action that, it, that, that should be worth me doing or not? And that's another thing that differentiates us from the non-believers. They dress how they want to dress, do what they want to do. They have no morality and they never hold themselves accountable before they do anything. They don't bathe like we do on a regular basis. They don't pray like we do on a regular basis. So they have no spiritual beauty and they have no outer beauty either. And again, this is what's gonna make us stand out on the day of judgment. Remember, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that another way he will be able to recognize his people is from the shining faces, the shining arms and, and feet that we'll have because of our wudu. The non-believers won't have that. Also, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, my nation will be called on the day of judgment as brightly radiant from the traces of their wudu. Okay, so again, guys, our whole way of living, our whole matter of ethics, when it comes to worship, when it comes to cleanliness, and all of that distinguishes us from the non-believers. And that's what it's all about, guys, being distinct. Not trying to blend in, not trying to be accepted by them, we have to take the laws of Allah, take the commands of Allah, apply them. Does everybody understand that? And make sure you definitely explain this to your children. Okay, I'm gonna stop right here for today. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika. Ashadu an la ilaha ila anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk.